is Kelly Malkowski. I'm the park superintendent here at Resaca de la Palma State Park. We're located in Brownsville, Texas. The park itself is pretty large at 1,200 acres and we'll be talking about some of our cool native trees you can find here. So this right here is a little cedar elm. Um, they're a deciduous tree, so that means that they lost most of their leaves. This time of year, it can be a little trickier to identify them. Um, can you get a close-up of the leaf? So the leaf has this rough edge to it, and that can be a great way of identifying them. Um, this one was, of course, planted. This is not uh, natively, naturally occurring in this spot, and it's still a pretty young tree. So when it's fully mature, it might be up to 50 feet tall. Um, we're not at that point. They're a really great shade tree for folks that um, want to have shade, and they're incredibly tolerant. If it's a drought, they're fine. If it's flooded, they're fine. Cedar elm. Okay, and we can walk over to the Wisaches. And we're walking, and we're walking. This is a Wisache tree. Um, you're really in luck because they're in bloom right now. It's um, February the 6th and we're almost in full bloom. The Wisaches all around the park are releasing their lovely fragrance and more importantly, they're attracting a lot of insects. So it's a very popular tree right now for our, our migrants, for warblers. Um, it attracts the bugs, the bugs attract the warblers and everybody gets a little something to eat. I really like when these Wisaches produce their seed pod. Um, they're the most satisfying thing ever to step on. They have a very satisfying crunch and then that releases all of their seeds. Okay, keep walking, keep walking. Um, hi. Oh, okay. This one might work. Seen here is a Texas ebony tree. Um, a big reason why the park is a park is the preservation of, of ebony and aqua woodlands and mature forest. Um, there's a fair amount of it in the park. Again, this one has been intentionally planted, um, but I like it because you can really see the variegation on the bark. And then if you look on the ground, you can see the seed pods. Um, this time of year, all of the good stuff, the seeds have already been consumed or they're decomposing. When the seeds just dry out, you can shake it and it sounds like a maraca. For people, we've used them um, as a food source. So when they're green, you might boil them like a peanut and eat them. You can dry them out and grind them up into coffee. That was really common during like the Great Depression or lean time, so you could stretch out those coffee grounds. For the insects, um, they tend to bore in when they're still green and then get at the seeds and then it's hard for them to break through the whole seed pod. So you see a lot of this activity, that boring, and they're perfect circles, which I love. Um, ebony's are also really interesting because they're very territorial. Uh, an ebony tree wants to be surrounded by other ebony trees. The seed pods they drop suppress other growth underneath them. Um, and that is a good way that you can tell if the ebony's are mature or not is, is there anything in the understory? And these are doing a pretty good job suppressing even grass. So if you look, there's almost no grass growing under any of these ebony trees. So this is um, a dead Washingtonian palm. They're not native to Texas, but they've naturalized. So that means that they're not um, invasive or that intrusive on the landscape. And we have six in a row, um, they're all dead. We leave them standing because they provide great nesting habitat for woodpeckers. When you're in cities here in the Rio Grande Valley, they make great nesting habitat for um, various parrot species. So even though they're not all leafy and they don't have their like tall fronds, you'll have to imagine that, um, you see these on most of the highways and roads as you're driving around, um, when people think of like the Magic Valley and the palm trees, a lot of them are, are these Washingtonians. Then we can spin around. Again, not the best time of year for these. Um, in the summertime when they're in bloom, it's Ooh, yeah. beautiful. Um, so this is a, a Mexican olive tree. Um, it has a lot of common names, so Mexican olive, Texas olive, Texas wild olive, um, in the valley of Naquanita. This time of year, um, they're not in bloom, but they produce a beautiful big white showy flower. That flower attracts loads of pollinators, hummingbirds, butterflies. They're all very attracted to this tree. Um, 
they do produce a fruit and when that flower dries up it falls down so some folks don't like them as an ornamental because they do produce goop and it falls on your car and you have to deal with that but if you are willing to to train them um, they're very tolerant you can keep them short like a hedge you can let them grow bigger and taller they'll take a lot of that human activity again not the right time of year but if you look under the leaflets you can see where they've been chewed on and that's generally from a tortoise beetle and tortoise beetles are beautiful when they're immature you can see right through their outer shells into their insides they're just an immaculately interesting beetle to check out when can you expect to see the beetle generally spring so we need it to, to warm up a little bit more and be warmer for longer we'll see them intermittently through the summer it just depends on how hot it is keep scooching along This weird wibbly tree is a honey mesquite. They're an incredibly common tree in the state of Texas um, and people have big feelings about them. It's either the, oh yeah, they're okay, or they absolutely hate them. So mesquites get a pretty bad rap because they're very thirsty. Um, this tree probably has a tap root that's 25 feet deep and then their radial roots, which go out in a big circle, can be anywhere between 25 and 50, depending on the individual tree. So they're a really well-rooted tree, deep-rooted tree. That gives them a lot more access to groundwater than some of our other tree species. Um, that being said, they fix nitrogen. So anywhere a mesquite tree is, they've enriched the soil beneath them. That's why you see understory. Um, these grasses are non-native and not ideal. Ideally, we would be seeing native Texas grasses. Um, but this tree has enriched the soil for them. When they're younger trees, um, they provide like great nurseries for a lot of our smaller birds. Uh, if you're a mama deer, a mesquite tree is a good place to bed your baby down. And when they produce their fruits, they look like long green beans. Everybody loves to eat them. You could be a coyote, you could be a person, you could be a butterfly. Almost any animal in our landscape in some way, shape or form takes advantage of what a mesquite tree produces or the protection they offer other animals. Um, sometimes people will cons confuse a wisache with a uh, mesquite tree. They're cousins, but they're definitely not the same. And you can really tell when you look at their leaflets, the wisache has shorter leaflets and the mesquite has a little bit of a longer leaflet. Okay, keep on. Armadillo friends have been very busy, it looks like. Yeah, they really like looking for it. Yeah, there must be um, a grub or something that's more prevalent in this spot than anywhere else. Oh. So don't mind us. So this is like one of my favorite mesquites in the park because it's just so gnarly. It just it makes me think of like fairies and fairy tales that this would be like their little tree that they would live in. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of get a general sense for what happened to a mesquite based on how it grows. So if you want a tall trunked mesquite tree, then it has to have a very gentle early planthood. If they get disturbed when they're very young, that's when you start seeing like the more of a shrub-like appearance versus a true straight tree. So when you're like, oh, I'll just hit it with the lawn mower, you're just adding, adding to your problems. This 
is just like a baby sandpaper tree or a little like baby anakwa. Um, I like it though because when we do a tree walk, I don't often let people touch things, but this is a great tree to stop. You can. hear how rough they are. Um, this is a pretty handy tree for our wildlife. Uh, it produces a berry they really like to eat in the winter time if they last that long. And I just love that. The lore that I've heard is that the ladies in the early 1900s when maybe things were um, a little harder to get would use these to clean up before church. So you'd like clean up your nails, your rough elbows, any of the rough spots on your hand. Like send out the girls to get some leaves and they get cleaned up. No avocado mud masks at that point. <laughs> so this is um, a sable palm, our name Rosaca de la Palma, palm tree. Um, sables are the only native palm of South Texas. They're really pretty drought tolerant. They can really stand a lot of um, salinity in the soil. This one I like because it has such a broad canopy, but it's not our biggest or the tallest in the park. This is just kind of the closest, easiest, big one to see. Um, we have a couple of much larger sables out and about in the park, but you really have to hike to get there. The fronds, as they dry out, um, become more fibrous. And in the springtime, we see Altamir Orioles hanging out, collecting all of those fibers to then build their pendulum nests. boardwalk. So this is our Rasaka bed and you notice that it's dry. Um, that is with some intent. We've been doing a lot of maintenance on the Rasaka itself. It was getting inundated with um, Zarza or Black Mimosa. Um, again another one, Touch Me Not, one of those plants that has loads of names. In and of itself is not necessarily a bad or problematic plant, but when it is encroaching further and further every year um, and eating up more and more of our open water habitat, it was something that we needed to remediate. So we used a, a mulcher, which is like this big grapply circular thing that just chews it up. And then that mulch, of course, will stay in the Rasaka to hopefully um, reinvigorate the soil with those nutrients. So to put that back into the ground for some of the more desirable species, like say sable palm, or once we get a little farther in, I'll point out the, zoom, the Montezuma cypresses. So, this is probably our biggest Montezuma in the park. It's further in that corner. I'm not sure if you can see the little green. Yep. So the trunk starts there. Montezuma cypresses are super, super cool trees. They're very long lived. Um, what I've seen documented is up to 2000 years. They can get very, very tall and really big and fat. So that tree has the potential to continue to grow and grow and grow. Um, we have a younger individual over here. That one's just a couple of years old, intentionally planted in our Rasaka so we can help maintain these really interesting trees. They're not like a bald cypress. They don't necessarily put out those knees. Um, their, soil, their roots just go deep into the soil and drink up the water. They're very thirsty. And that's why we see fewer and fewer of them in Brownsville because they really like their feet to be wet. They want to be almost in water. So the original native old growth, there's not a lot of, but I've seen it as um, 
an ornamental tree in some places here in Brownsville, which makes my heart happy that whoever that landscape designer is, is putting some effort into um, using native plants of the Rio Grande Valley that have intrinsic worth to our native spit, native animals, wildlife, whatever. So yeah, it was a long walk to get here to see the cypresses. <laughs> How old are these? <laughs> um, this guy, I think, was planted 2008, 10, somewhere in there. And then these, um, I think, are maybe five years old, a, a later planting. That's neat. I don't think I knew they were here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like we have thousands of them, but there's a couple that are and see how far apart they are intermittently spaced in our Rasaka in hopes that we can support those really cool trees. I forget the town in Mexico, but there's like a mammoth one that the whole town surrounds. Like there's these super cool pictures. I'm like, ah, oh, that's such a big tree. So we'll head back to the parking lot and then we have one more quarter mile-ish walk to get to the like another tree that's very notable in the park that I want to spend some time with. of the of the track that we're on so it was originally purchased as a wildlife management area so the 1200 acres was put together to preserve habitat for white-winged dove because at that time their population numbers had plummeted and there just really wasn't a lot of habitat being maintained for their nesting so the park got set aside um, purchased in 77 and then in 2008 it was turned over to us and turned into a state park so a lot of this infrastructure stuff like this of course was probably a game trail because those are the easier things for us to modify and turn into people trails. Um, and this one has a special substrate that helps make it ADA compliant so anybody can access it. Some of our other trails are a little rougher. They're either made of grass or caliche and it's harder to navigate those. Um, but this one is just pretty easy peasy casual walk. Some sections, like this is old growth, and you can tell that by the understory. So there's some understory plants, but for the most part, it's clear underneath. Parts of the park were revegetated. They were open cropland, so um, native trees were put in. And when you go to those spaces, um, those baby trees were not given a very easy life. It was they were planted, and then you do on your own. They weren't watered. Um, and because the growth there is so small, they were put, put in in the 70s, and Depending on the tree species, like a wisache, it'll grow way faster than, say, uh, a mesquite tree. Or a tepawahe grows even faster than a wisache. So when we go into those spaces, you can see which trees are pioneering and very tolerant of drought conditions, and which trees really probably would have benefited from um, an intensive watering program. It just wasn't possible. Like, the water resources were just a little too scarce at that time. Clearly, this is new growth. Look at, besides what the mesquite are supporting underneath them, you see all of that vegetation in the understory. Part of the park lore and history, it's not 100% clear, but those Washingtonians, at some point in this section, they were, um, they had a little plant nursery. So we see some weird stuff in the park. We're like, what is that doing here? And it comes over from those, um, the point in the park's history when it wasn't a park, it wasn't a wildlife management area. It was just someone's property and they're growing some cool plants. So 
So I've mostly only been talking about native trees, but I don't know if you can see it, but this guy, um, that's an Australian pine and they're a non-native and you see them a lot in the valley. They can get problematic quickly. Like this one is um, on our cut down list. We didn't even know it was there until last summer it just whew, shot up over the tree line. We're like, what's that tall tree doing over there? And it's one of those Australian pines. They just are too aggressive. Like we're talking about the Washingtonians where you're like, man, you know, I wouldn't mind you growing back. These are just like, well, we live here now. We're taking over everything. At one of um, like the sister sites here in the valley, Camp Rio, they have uh, an Australian pine grove, but they've done like the coolest thing ever. They turned it into a little nature playscape for the kids and it's well shaded and pretty cool in there. I was like, wow, that's the best thing I've seen done with those besides just chop them down. Like how cool. Yeah, like a, like a glamour shot of the parking lot with all of the wisaches in bloom. And it's so easy to tell when the wisaches aren't in bloom, they just kind of blend in. But like when various tree species are, my brain is like, oh my gosh, we have so many of those. When the ebony's put on their, um, their flowers or when the mesquites put on their flowers, like, wow. Well, mesquites have catkins, excuse me on that one. But it's just a great indicator of what you have whenever something is in bloom because it's so much more apparent to your eye. Um, so this is one of my favorite tree names to say, but impossible for me to ever spell correctly. This is a Tepawahe, which has a, a T, a P, and a J in it, which I always struggle with the order. Um, they're one of the few valley trees that really gets tall, like a really tall, stately tree. The only downside to Tepawahes is they don't live very long. So they're a pioneering tree species. They shoot up, they grow really fast. Um, they propagate themselves really well, but they just die pretty quick. I just love the way their leaves dance in the breeze. I just find them incredibly pretty. So what's their lifespan? What I've read, um, you know, not a lot over that 30, 40 mark. And when we have a tree down in the park, after a big rainstorm, after Hannah, it's almost always Tepawahes. I'm like, guys, just be a little more deeply rooted. Just hang in there a little more. But crash. For whatever reason, I'm not sure if it's just localized in the park, but they tend to be the heaviest hit when we have big wind events. Um, either losing large limbs or the whole tree just comes out, even though it looks relatively healthy. All right, we'll pop around here, continue our walking. Just like, bam, look how pretty that is. Like, wisaches are not necessarily a very showy tree until they're the showiest tree. <laughs> so we'll do about a quarter mile walk to the next tree. So about the same distance um, as we just hiked on the Ebony Trail. So this is a, a pretty good like pan of how the Tepawahes colonize and are, are pioneering. So this one isn't um, the most attractive, but it's very close and convenient to see. So this is a ratama. Um, they drop their leaves and then they can photosynthesize through their bark. So that green bark allows them to um, utilize photosynthesis even if they don't have a big full canopy. 
And again, another tree that puts on a very, very pretty yellow flower, but that's closer to the summer. We're still a little early for them. Also, the thorns are awful. Um, one time I got poked and it took a month for me to like work the thorn tip out of my thumb. It just festered. It was super gross. Yeah, I was like, why did I wear gloves? <laughs> what a mistake. Like you see drought tolerance in literally every tree. So these teeny tiny leaves everywhere. That is such a good adaptation against losing water through photorespiration. So as our trees are breathing, they lose that water resource, but having those tiny leaves protect you from that. So if you're back east and you're in those huge deciduous hardwood forests where the leaves are bigger than your face or your hand, well, that tells you it rains a lot. If you see big leaves, those trees either are really deeply rooted and they get a lot of water from the ground or it's not that hot. But what we don't see, um, this is the Rio Grande Valley. If it's cold, everybody dies. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you're a person, if you're a tree. Um, trees can't put on their heavy coats and their heavy gloves. They just keel over. I was at one of the local museums, like the Museum of South Texas History, um, and I didn't realize that the valley used to be covered in date palms. It was way before my time, before I was even alive. But I guess there were several subsequent winters that were incredibly cold and it killed the palms. That's a super cool museum. popular with families that have kind of inexperienced riders because there's no vehicle traffic. You don't have to really worry about riding on a sidewalk or cars or whatever because it's just people. So we've walked past about 10 million hackberry trees, but I was hoping to find some that still had their berries. So I was going to talk about their berries, but I just haven't seen a single one um, with the little hackberries on there. But they make these super bright orange berries, which this time of year when it's dry, um, wildlife can eat that and they'll get their water metabolically. Uh, we, I think we have this concept that like wildlife drinks water, um, and sometimes they do, but a lot of times that water comes from what they eat. Those hackberries are a good water resource in the wintertime, but I just haven't seen any. And then people apparently collect them to make a, a jam that tastes like cantaloupe, um, but I don't like cantaloupe, so I've never done that before. And you're not allowed to collect resources in a state park, so I have never tried any hackberry jam. But again, another tree that will um, completely stab through your whole body. Interesting, these sables are just like... Yep. Just intermixed. So this section of the park, um, were you here in 2018 in June when there's that massive flood event? No. So the park <laughs> flooded. So a lot of this section of the park will just sit underwater for weeks and weeks when we have big huge flood events. And I think that's helpful to those palms. They're tolerant of the, the big rain events. Yeah, and it was really, really bad. All right, if you had to ask me what's my favorite, 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 favorite tree, it's this one. Look at this. Look at this. Look at it. Look at it. It has a huge crown. It's really big. It's a big Mexican ash tree. Um, we got it measured by the big tree people out of like the A&M foresters, and we're not the biggest Mexican ash on public lands, which what I, I was hoping we would be. Um, we're going to try again in a couple of years and get remeasured to see if we maybe beat some of the other trees. 
I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up with a real fall where the leaves fell off the trees and you gathered them and you played in the leaves. This is about the only tree in the park that gives me that sensation of true fall. Yeah, I just love it. Just love it. And then I think of this as like the, the grandmother, grandfather tree because behind it you see a little ash grove. That is neat. I just like the way the bark is variegated, the way the trunks are split, the crown size, just everything about that tree I find immensely appealing. This is one that, like you said, you can tell that at some point in time something happened when it was young and boom, all of a sudden we have these. All those forked trunks. And this tram road, um, of course, got put in when the park got put in. They moved it, the original design, to not heavily impact this tree. So the tram road, if I read the schematics correctly, were supposed to be on the other side, but they thought that it'd be too much impact, so it got scooched over. Which I love. Build around it. I have one more tree on my list, and we um, there's a very convenient one at the visitor center. Okay. You head back that way. Yeah, like this one, that Rotama. Love it. Love that green bark. Am I right that it's the the younger branches? Mm -hmm. Yep, the new growth, new shoots. And then as they have new branches. Mm -hmm. Yep, then the bark darkens. That's what's super neat and what I would encourage your TMNs to do is maybe find a site and visit it regularly because the, the flavor of the park changes every day. Every day there's something new to notice or something new to like interact with that changes seasonally. Like this year we have a fairly rare bird called a, a Hammond's flycatcher and it's just like a small bird and I'd never seen one before in my life and then this winter one showed up. And it's essentially lived in the parking lot, which is very kind, because um, it's convenient to bird on my lunch break. So this tree falls under my, um, like always be a learner and be willing to learn something new. This is a little potato tree. It has these little blooms that kind of like look a little bit like potatoes. Humans are not supposed to eat them. I've heard that these are really toxic for us. But I thought that this was a shrubby tree, that it did not get very tall. And I recently learned that these things get huge, 25 feet tall, which is like a pretty sizable tree. Um, so we're going to try to very delicately transplant these three potato trees and then these two little babies because they're a fairly rare tree for the Rio Grande Valley. Um, you don't see them in a lot of places. And in my head, because I've only ever seen them small, I thought that meant they stayed small. Nope. So we can't have a 25 foot tall tree right by the flagpole. And then these are, yeah, those little Cenisos. Texas Sage. Another tree that is shrubby brush that's very tolerant to being um, manicured. So this one is a little more hedge-like. But right beside it, like right now the prevailing wind is the wrong way, but this little grove is all wind dispersion. So that was not planted. That's parent plants. Bam. Babies. We do. We do have Papanak in the park, but it's like way in there and in the Rasaka. 
So um, for the most part, we fight that fight and we have a lot of the Papanak and the Brazilian pepper beat back. We have a pretty, um, we're pretty aggressive with those trees because they are super aggressive themselves. Um, but nowhere that's like convenient for us to walk and not have to like hike for a couple of hours. You're like, oh, look, it's right here. Now, could you describe how you fight that fight? Because many like myself have been fighting it for years because they're growing in our backyard. It's, it's never ending. So it's constant surveillance. Um, it's when they're bigger, um, cutting them and then drilling holes. And then you pour in what works well for us are like the cheap ketchup bottles you get at like the dollar store and you fill that up with herbicide and then it slowly sucks into that cut. Um, and then it gets into the root system, digging them out manually if they're small, like if they're little bitties, like those little baby potato trees and then getting out as much of the root as possible. Um, but it is, very time consuming, very labor intensive, and a never ending fight. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll always fight those. Don't help. No, they don't. Um, like China Berry, too. Yeah. Everything wants to live in the Rio Grande Valley. That's not from here. Like, I grew up in Illinois. I'm happy in the valley. Like, lots of plants are not from here. They're happy here. Um, it's just lots of things are on a spectrum. So, like, how bad is it? Like, that Australian pine is going to completely take over and push out all of the other natives. But the Washingtonian is not, and it's going to provide very useful habitat for very interesting, cool birds. So to me, it's you pick your battles. Like what can you reasonably fight and push back? And what is going to take $2 million to fix? And what is going to take a lifetime to think about and fix? That's what, like the non-native grasses. If I had a magic wand and I could bippity boppity boop them away and produce native grasses in this park like that is a sweet sweet dream and wish that I have maybe someday we'll be able to I would love even a cultivated patch of native grasses I think that would be amazing and in the park where we see non-native grasses we have a huge grassland an expansive grassland it's about 250 acres and it's almost a dead zone you don't see a lot of insect activity you don't see a lot of small mammals there's not a lot of um birds flying over, predatory birds hunting, where if it was a more native grassland, you would see all of that activity because those native grasses are much more productive for our wildlife. Um, you mentioned a little bit about the, those early trees. Pioneering tree species or colonizing tree species, either of those. Um, what comes next? So you tend to start out with like Tepawahes, Wisaches, Mesquites, and then as those live and die, you start getting the slower growing, slower moving things like your ebonies, your anaquas. Um, depending on water resources, the palms can come in. So of course this is a palm that we've planted and it gets flood irrigated once a month from the hydrant being flushed. But at the same time this one was planted, there's a baby over there. Oh yeah, I did get a shot of that one. Yeah, they were planted at the same time. Ah, that's a good comparison to be able to sort of say this if is you what it takes. water them a lot they can get really big um the one over there has just been you know left on its own so it's taken a lot longer people will ask me to like guess how old the palm is in the park and i'm like i don't know i'm not sure it really depends on how much water they've gotten Um, the Visitor Center is open Wednesday through Sunday, 8 to 5, so if you ever want to come and visit the park, you can have access.